I'm Christopher D. Philippus. This is Skipper Martin. And you're listening to the Stephen King Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Stephen King Podcast. I'm here with my co-author, uh, co-host, sorry. Oh, <laughs> author is good. I'll take it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's in the same uh, business, so. <laughs> yeah. And I am an aspiring writer, so. <clears throat> yeah, you see. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's already starting to rub off on you. There it goes. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so this is episode 54, and today we are doing something uh, a bit special. Uh, we're having two other podcast fellows on, Chris DiFilippo and Skipper Martin. And these two fellows are going to, well, they have already started a 11.22.63 podcast that's uh, over at barrenspace.com. And they will talk about, in the first episode, they will talk about the book and then they will talk about the Hulu miniseries. And we thought it was uh, would be cool to take them to our podcast and have them talk a bit, a bit about what they were going to do. And boy, could they talk. <laughs> yeah, we just put it on autopilot and sat back. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. awesome. <laughs> yes, it was a great interview. So more of that later. But uh, as usual, we will start off with the news. Welcome, welcome. Do not fear the door that lies before you. We will protect you. We are your guides, Hans and Lou. And we will give you the latest in Stephen King news. But before we do so, you must prove yourself worthy. You must open the door and join us in the death room. And first up is more fuel to the fire, but this is kind of a sneaky fire that one site reported that the rumor of Idris Elba being cast as Roland is was official, but nowhere in that article do they actually provide a link to an official announcement. So we're treating this as more of a clickbait type of article, but Akiva Coldsmith has been interviewed and confirmed that Elba is in the running for the role. So so there is definitely some substance to it, but it it's in no way at this time official. And if you want to hear more thoughts about what we think about this casting, you can go back to our episode 52, where we talked about this quite extensively, me and Hans. And as a bonus to the guests that we have on today, we asked them this question as well, just to, because it's causing so much controversy, the more opinions about it, I think it's, uh, and the more informed everybody can be, and and maybe will help some people rethink their position or re-examine their current position, uh, whether they're for or against it. So check that out at the end of this interview. Yeah, and I would also like to mention that in the comments that Goldsman said, I think that He's pretty harsh on those who doesn't like Elba, and uh, I think that he is fueling the the thought that a lot of people doesn't want him because they are racist. And I think that is uh, is a sad way to do it. I think I personally felt a little bit insulted by him because I, as you know, if you listen to our earlier podcast, I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't want Elba as Roland, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm definitely not a racist, so. I think he, he should he should have formulated himself in, in a different way, I think. I can definitely understand why you would feel like that. I, I think when he the way I read that comment, he was specifically for referring to people that just don't like it for the skin color yeah. and nothing else. But he understands the other people that have concerns about making a change like this, that, and uh, hopefully they will, if this comes to a pass, take that into consideration. But yep. no doubt, this is this is a very contentious issue, and I think it bears repeating. And just in case, through any postings that I've done, or in through the conversations of these podcasts, I totally under I totally understand why some people don't like yourself, Hans, 
uh, are not would not like to see this casting and that there's nothing wrong with that if you, it's a, it's if it's a preference that you want them to stick as close to the source material that's fine mm. I, and i don't think you, fortunately these kind of things all these other things get pulled into it about race and what and so, yeah. social justice wars and all that and i don't want what we're saying to be an inference of whether or not we're calling people a racist or not because we're definitely not no no that's it's it's, not. it's a subjective thing i mean some people like the Beatles. Some people like the Rolling Stones. It's just, it's just one of those things. I mean, yeah. and, and I'll restate my position, all things being equal, if you've got a, a white actor and a back actor and they're really close, then I would prefer if they went with the, the white actor. I just feel, from what I'm reading and, uh, about the situation, is Elba seems to be the best fit right now based on time and schedule. That's all where I'm coming from. So I'm not definitely don't yeah. want anybody to think I'm calling them racist because if that was true, then me and Hans wouldn't be doing this podcast anymore. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and, and I want, I want to mention something else that he says that really doesn't have to do with Elba and, and Roland, but he says, I think that what we do as filmmaker is interpret. And when a filmmaker says that it makes me, think that they are going to take a lot of liberation with the story material and uh, not maybe it's maybe it's me who, who read too much in it but it it sounds to me like the he he wants to take the the basis of the story and then run freely with it much like Kubrick did with the shining mm -hmm. uh, and just make it the base of the book and then take the story and maybe go different sides with it and that scares me even more that he he says something like that because i i hope they will try to keep it as close to the book as possible mm -hmm. yep yeah i that a legitimate concern for sure yep yep yeah okay and the second news today and also the last news today is as we have mentioned before that uh, the movie version of cell with pre would premiere in uh, the UK on February 26. Now it's clear also that that will be the world premiere of the movie that will take place in Scotland Glasgow Film Festival. So if you live in in Glasgow, uh, Scotland, I guess you will be among the first to see this movie. Couldn't you go to that house? Isn't that just like a car drive away? Ah, oh, well, <laughs> a couple of a couple of nature stops on the way, so and I'm there. <laughs> Can't you just swim across the ocean or something? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I would if I could. <laughs> uh, that would be kind of fun, though, eh? But, uh, yeah, it would be great. Yeah. But it would be a very expensive and, and uh, much time to, to put on just seeing a movie. But if, if, they had the, if they had the actors there and you could schedule some interviews and stuff like that, then definitely it would be something I would consider. I wonder if they're going to be there. Uh, yeah, I think I... I I think it's often the case that once the movie is done and it takes very long for it to be released, it's very hard to get the actors sure. to right. yeah. the movie and promote it because they are they're tied up in other stuff. For sure. Uh, sure. So I think I think we will see quite li little press around this one. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Yeah, but that's just. And I think through the Stephen King forum, we've sort of come to pass, too, that this movie will be getting a, a theatrical release in North America as well. Yeah. I'm not really sure about the dates. Maybe it'll be around Halloween, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But uh, that's good news because we, uh, we still don't have a definite uh, release date, but it does sound like it is on the schedule to be released, which is because we were worried that it wasn't going to get released at all and just sit on the shelf and maybe go straight to video or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm a bit surprised that we haven't seen a trailer or even a short teaser for it yet. Well, I mean, it, it, that all depends when it comes out. If it's not coming out until October, it's way too early for a trailer. You only start doing that like two months before. Yeah, but I mean for the UK release, because I, I would suspect that it would be out in the UK. No, it's probably just gonna it's probably just gonna play at that festival, I would think. But I might be wrong. Yeah, I guess we'll see. Yeah. Okay, and that is it for the news. This is great. What's our job? We'd like to drive around and pick up stiffs or what? It's time for reviews from The Night Shift. Welcome to this segment of the Stephen King Podcast, where we'll be talking to Skipper Martin and Chris DeFilippis. Did I say that right? 
DeFilippis. DeFilippis, my apologies. And they are running a 112263 podcast over at barrenspace.com. That's correct. We thought we'd do a little, have them guest on our podcast to talk about what they're going to be doing on their podcast. And just to find out from non diehard Stephen King fans, unlike me and Hans, uh, what, the, what their <laughs> thoughts are on the book. So if one of you guys want to kick it off and tell us about your background. I could start it off very easy. You're a liar. But you don't know that. <laughs> See, you, you've been told that this is the 112263 podcast that is supposed to be about the Hulu miniseries. Unfortunately, we were lied to. Chris, am I right? <laughs> well, to a degree, to a degree, because it it's was a still, loving lie. Yeah, and it still is about 112263, the book and the television adaptation. But it seems to have been morphed into something neither of us have expected. And what's that? Such a nice way to put it. We've been <laughs> lied to. All uh -oh. right. <laughs> Producer Albie Burge, Albert Burge, w w by name. Who lied to us? Oh, that would be Albert Burge. Hi, Albert. And what, <laughs> what exactly did he say? He said, what, did it, what was it? Don't worry. It's a limited podcast. It's an event podcast. You're in, you're out. You know, I mean, the guy should sell cars, man. I'm serious. <laughs> So he starts off with, don't worry, you got a few episodes uh, about the Hulu show and a few episodes about the book and bada bing, bada boom, no problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so over the weekend, uh, we all got a little bit shocked because we thought, no, 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 I'll say this right. I thought foolishly, naively, stupidly that 11-22-63 the idea behind a time traveler going back to stop the Kennedy assassination. I assumed that that was a, a basically an original idea. And little did I know uh, how absolutely wrong I was because soon after we started out, we said, oh, by the way, which was a trend. Oh, by the way. Oh, by the way, <laughs> there's this movie about a time traveler that goes back to stop the Kennedy assassination. I said, yeah, I think we're already doing it. No, no, no. 1990 with Robert Hayes called Running Against Time. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Could you guys watch that and we'll do it as a bonus? Hey, I like bonuses. Bonus. One bonus. We can do a bonus. <laughs> and then wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's another one. Oh, do tell. What's this one called? Time Quest. And it's got who's in it? Um, the Mighty Mighty Bruce Campbell. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Bruce Campbell's in it. Yeah. So, and that came from 2000. And then he said, oh, by the way. Oh, oh, by the way, there's a Twilight Zone episode. Oh, oh, you know what? Did too. Well, let's just go down the list. And it ended up being 13 or 14 books <laughs> that have all covered the same story. <laughs> wow. And three or four TV adaptations, two TV films. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, to be fair to Albie, I think he is just very enthusiastic because how can you not listen to the first show between Skip and me and think anything, but this needs to go on forever for as long as I can drag oh, it out because absolutely. these guys are gold. These guys are magic on the mic. And he's right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't think that we are going to cover every single book that we come across Let's or do it every definitively, property. Man. Definitively, we are not <laughs> going well, to do it. You never know what's going to happen after the miniseries. No, no, no. Ends. We know. We know. <laughs> <laughs> We're positive. Ain't happening. Okay. Uh, they can hold us to it. We said no. But, but I can uh, I can say this. Um, having done a couple of shows about the novel already. I'm surprised at how much we're able to talk about just different sections, specific sections of the book. So talking about the TV show, I think is going to be a much different experience for the both of us because it'll be much more reactionary. Right, right now we're doing things. It's, it's a much more deliberate discussion about things about the book that we liked, things about the book that we don't like, but how it all comes together and our overall impression of the work as a whole. As we watch the Hulu series, I think it's going to be a much more piece-by-piece -piece exploration of what's unfolding every week. And I think that that aspect of it is also... Um, let me start again. I think that that aspect of it will also carry over to doing reviews of any kind of film or TV show that has this as a premise as well. Because speaking about the book is great, but we've both read it and we're talking a lot about a known property. 
And if we can speak about different things, mm -hmm. I think that it, in a different way. And I look forward to that. So, Skip, I'm not I'm not dismissing it out out of hand right yet. <laughs> All right. All right. You're going to get a new co-host. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, so start your auditions now. So why don't you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves before this podcast took over your life? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you, you, um, could you uh, say again, Lou, you broke up on this. Uh, sure. Uh, can you tell us about your, each other, about your background before you started doing the 112263 podcast? Chris, you want to start that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I uh, am a journalist by trade and a TV producer. But I've always loved radio. When I went to journalism school, I majored in broadcasting. And when I was doing the broadcasting, we had to do a radio and a TV segment on, uh, on different years. And my second year, I did the TV requirement, and I ran back to radio. I think I was the first one in the history of the broadcast section that <laughs> went from radio to TV and then went back to radio. That's how much I love doing radio. So. Cool. When I was working as a journalist for a local cable company here on Long Island, a TV producer doing editorials on a 24-hour news channel that we have, I also discovered a friend who worked at the local college radio station who did a science fiction show every Friday night. And he had me on to interview me about my first book. I'm an author, too. I'm a published author. I wrote a Quantum Leap novel years, oh, okay. and years, and years ago. Yeah. So... Once I discovered, though, that there was an outlet here on Long Island for science fiction audio, I started doing a segment for his show every month called The Flip Side, and I turned that into a website, and I've always meant to turn it into a podcast. I just never really had the gumption because I didn't really know what kind of format I wanted to do. I love doing these little segments, and I love talking about science and science fiction and just genre stuff in general. Right. He cool. approached me to do this. Well... Let me, that's kind of revisionist history. I approached Alby because I had started listening to the Quantum Leap podcast, which he also produces and hosts with his wife, Heather. And he invited me to do a segment, much like my Deflip Side segments every month or every show on, on that podcast. And from that, a uh, relationship sprung up. And he, out of the blue, said, you know, I know this guy, Skip, and we have this 112263 podcast that we'd like to do. And I'm firmly convinced that he set us up because we were having a, <laughs> quote, air quotes here, production meeting for the Baron Space team. Baron Space is Albie's production company. That's the umbrella that we're all working under right now. And towards the end of the call, he started Skip and I on a discussion about Stephen King. And I don't know if we recorded it, Skip, but I just want to oh, maybe... recorded. Oh, There's we, proof somewhere. We need to go back and listen to just no, how he manipulated no, us into no, doing this because <laughs> we went on for over an hour just discussing different books that we had read and um, how we liked them, how we didn't like them. And it turns out Skip and I have very different reading experiences with diff uh, different Stephen King novels. And we like almost none of the same ones. It's really funny. That's cool. And, and I think we play off each other well in that respect. Yeah, that's so, good. That's good to have. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I, I can throw it to you, Skip. I've been talking a lot. Uh, I've read a bunch of books. <laughs> okay <laughs> all right all right all right um <laughs> moving uh, on no <laughs> i <clears throat> i work in television post-production i'm a colorist i've been doing it uh i've been doing tv post tv and film since 1991 and uh, i'm currently a, a working colorist and in the middle of all that uh i think albie was doing you know for the quantum Leap podcast uh you know, little thumbnails that you put on your website, just little thumbnail images, and they, and they look pretty ugly. You know, someone who knows who captured them. Mm -hmm. And I think as a joke, as you know, I was like, hey, you want those colored? <laughs> I mean, really, that's how, you know, apparently lonely and pathetic I am. Hey, would you like your <laughs> thumbnails colored? <laughs> Man, I can't even say that. Like, I can't believe I even offered it. And I, I think he took pity. Oh, I can't believe he asked me that. Yeah, dude, go ahead. Color them. <laughs> okay. And to this day, I don't think he's ever used any of them. But anyway. <laughs> can you, you know. can you explain a little bit uh, more clearly what coloring colorist does? Well, there's this thing called blue. Uh-huh. No, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I know certain colorists out there who really are so full of themselves that I think they truly believe they've literally invented green. Um, but oh, okay. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I am not one of those people. Okay. Not even close. What is a colorist? Um, 
I've been, I think every colorist sooner or later will be, uh, you know, asked at one point or another, do you colorize like old Cagney movies? No, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, we used to be called timers, uh, colorists. Uh, we get used for uh, a variety of purposes, but um, right now in the modern way to do things, you will have a dailies colorist, someone who's handling the raw footage, which essentially gives the editors and producers, directors, everyone in the post side um, a way of looking at the footage that that resembles what it's finally going to look like. So you don't look at something and expect to see Fight Club, but are looking at Family Matters, right? <laughs> I mean, it just looks... <laughs> Right. I don't want to say Family Matters looks bad. That's a bad example. No, it's not. <laughs> I hate that show. <laughs> and it's off the air and they can't come after me. That doesn't mean it didn't look bad. But anyways, um, right. you don't want the raw, ugly stuff directly out of the camera. And then as they're cutting it together, everyone has to say, no, don't worry about how this looks. It'll look better later. You know, Rather right. than that, they would like it to resemble the final. But the the magic trick is that I will get six hours of footage a day and the final show is only 23 minutes so you know wow. yet i have to make all of that footage resemble what the final should look like so that's really what a dailies colorist does then you have the final colorist who uh working along with the director of photography and the producers and anyone else who wants to put their fingers in the pie will you know drive the look to its final uh to its final style and okay. um sometimes it can be incredibly involved so uh in the case of let's say 11 63 off the top of my head they had to deal with two distinct looks mm -hmm. which is the modern day look and of course the look in the past right so i promise you there was a lot of back and forth <laughs> creatively on achieving that goal and that's what your final colorist is going to do uh, okay cool and so wow. that's what that guy does you guys have cool jobs. I, f I feel very ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All we got to do to be stars is come on this show. Uh, cool. <laughs> we are stars, Chris. There you go. You have to go to more podcasts and be bigger stars. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, well, each of you, uh, are we going to say something, Hans? Yeah. Uh, I guess you didn't know each other before you were offered this uh podcast for 11 no. right no no not. absolutely not no. And all we did was argue you mm. know the stand yeah. is a great book no it's not man <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you talking about did we read yeah, this half an hour book? later it was like you guys are hired what are we like, yeah. hired wow. yeah because i i think that when I, I listened to your first episode i think you you were very synced when you when you did it and the, you get, you got the feeling that you had had done several several episodes earlier so no, we I think, didn't. I think you did a great job with that. Oh, they sounded okay. like a married couple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I still to Juan. You got to give it to Juan. You got to right? give it to Juan, our, our editor. Um, I should say co-producer. And Albie is what the executive producer. Juan is the co-executive producer and the editor and the poor bastard that has to just make us sound like an old married couple that everybody wants to listen to because <laughs> there are so many false starts, especially on my part. Juan, I'm so sorry. He he sent me. Uh, thing on Facebook saying, Chris, I think you hold the record for a uh, number of times you rebegin a sentence. So he's <laughs> he's got a he's got a a, a whole. Uh, he's, see, I'm re, I'm I'm beginning again, yeah. but now he he's just got a chore work ahead of him every time we record because I'm never happy with the way I say things. Yep. But you know, that's his that's his cross to bear. He agreed to do that just like we agreed to do this. So get back to work, Juan. Everybody's waiting for that suckers. Tuesday deadline. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Juan Miro, thank you very much. See, see, we have proof. Someone said that we sound like we know what we're doing. That's got to be Juan because it ain't us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I also think that it's good in the sense that I don't really know what Skip is ever going to say. And Skip doesn't know what I'm going to say. Because I don't have a clue what yeah. he's going to say. And we don't know each other. So whenever he gives me a reaction about something, it's not like I'm talking to my friend of 20 years and I can just dismiss it out of hand because I've heard it all before. When he says stuff, it, it oftentimes makes me think about it in a way that I haven't before because I've never heard that point of view before. And I hope that part of that comes through on the podcast as uh, well. Yeah, it definitely does. You yeah. guys you guys really have a great uh, back and forth going. So, Because yeah, me and Hans, like, you know, it, it took us a while to get into a groove as well. Um, mm. But uh, I think we do pretty yeah. well as, now as well. Okay, so let's talk about your Stephen King background. Uh, what... Uh, if everybody wants to get an in-depth um, 
history of their of that, they should listen to their your is it zero point zero podcast? I think. Um, no, that was zero point one. Zero point one. We Sorry. talked about our background. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could just sort of give the Coles notes for each of you, for our listeners. You go ahead, Skip. Oh, I started with Stephen King with uh, the Dark Tower, and then graduated to the Stand. And uh, completely pushed out and went with the edited version of The Stand. But I redeemed myself later on and got the full uncut. <laughs> and then moved on to, um, I think from there, I am trying to remember this. I, 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 start, I then just started to devour the obvious ones from Christine because I'd seen the movie. Dead Zone because I'd seen the movie. And then just kept going. From there, you know, I hit all the popular ones and uh, especially the early ones. And then, of course, the Dark Tower series kicked in later, and I have not read them all, but I've read a, around 40 of them, and uh, quite a few of them more than once. So um, I'm no authority, and quite often, I'm sure someone will be listening to our podcast and go, man, is he completely misremembering it? And you'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Stoop, no, the stand, idiot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I don't have the best memory, but I did read it. I swear I did. I did. Yeah. So uh, that's my, and of course, a ton of movies and TV adaptations right. and so on and so forth. That's me. Chris? Well, I started reading King in my formative reading years. I was in my early to mid-teens, and I began with The Shining. And that completely blew me away, so I became a big fan immediately because you don't get much better than The Shining. And from there, I started buying these box sets of his books when I worked at the mall. There were a couple of bookstores in the mall that would sell like three packs of, say, Firestarter, The Dead Zone, and Carrie or Salem's Lot and Night Shift and uh, Skeleton Crew or, or whatever. And I would just find a new three-pack and read it through and then just go get another one. There was a time when I was reading so much Stephen King, I, by the time I was 15 or 16, that I wasn't even watching TV. I was just, I was just so entranced with, with his writing. And back then, after The Shining, the ones that grabbed me the most were It and Pet Cemetery. And I've discussed it at length on our second podcast, but um, I had really different, deep personal connections with both of those books, and they affected the way I looked at the world in certain ways. And right. as I got older, I, I, guess, I guess it was when I was in college, it was my first few years of college, my reading of King started to drop off a little bit, mm -hmm. and... Um, it started, I guess, with Four Past Midnight. I kind of liked the stories in that, but not as much as I used to. And then Tommy Knockers, I liked, but it wasn't the greatest. And then, man, when I read Needful Things, that one let me down so hard that I said, <laughs> "Okay, I think I'm done with Sting. Uh, I think I'm done with King for a while." Okay. And I didn't want to leave King with like a bad taste, but I felt, okay, maybe I'm outgrowing him. Maybe it's just not my bag anymore. So a good. God, it had to be 20 years past since I had read anything. And Misery was in one of the cafeterias at work. And I picked that up because I said, well, I love that movie. So mm -hmm. let me let me read the book. And that four-star effort, man, that book blew me away. It was awesome. So from that, I became less reticent to accept King again into my reading life. And I've had hits and misses here and there. I tried the Dark Tower series. Skip and I have gotten into this. Didn't like it that much. Um, I'm not a great fan. Of, I'm not a great fan of the stand. Mm. But eleven twenty two sixty three. When Albie asked me to go into this podcast, I did have some trepidation because I well, I have a spotty track record with Modern King. Am right. I going to like this? And I thought eleven twenty two sixty three was as good as anything I read back when I was in love with him. So I was very very pleasantly surprised by how much I got into the book and how much I really really loved it. Cool. Have have you read uh, like uh, I'm just thinking like post accident Stephen King accident. Have you read like others, the other books too, like Lisey stories and and things of like that? Or yeah, see here's where I get foggy because I'm give me a year when he had his accident. Uh, Ninety nine. Yeah. No. This is the no, you're talking about my sporadic period. Um, anything in the last sixteen years was probably Misery and the Dark Tower series. And probably another one I'm not even remembering, you know. Sure. But yeah, I I don't know much of his current stuff at all, much of his modern stuff at all. Okay. And I think the strength of eleven twenty two sixty three might make me go back and re-examine that. 
But then I think about some of the things about the Dark Tower that I didn't like, and it gives me trepidation again. It gives me pause. Mm-hmm. So I like listening to you guys because you you kind of said, Lou, you set yourself up to me as almost like a, like sort of a fanboy. But I've been listening to your pa- podcast, and you and, and Hans, you really don't just laud his work to laud his work. You guys take a critical view of almost everything you talk about. And yep. by critical, I don't mean that you were just dismiss it outright. I mean, critical in the sense that you examine it and you call it out for its strengths and its weaknesses. So, yeah, I, I try to give a balanced view and I don't wear rose colored glasses with anything that I like. The, I guess the only thing that makes me a fanboy is I'll read everything by him, even if it's the crappiest piece of junk you've ever seen, <laughs> just because within everything he writes, I always find some nuggets of gold. So from gotcha. that perspective, that's why uh, I'm a big King fan, because He's one of the few writers where the words for me disappear on the page. And if that makes me a fanboy, then so be it. You know, like um, it's yeah. more like a, sitting around a campfire, listening to somebody tell a story. And that's that's what I love yeah. about it. Oh, I got you. We, yeah. we even finished uh, Under the Dome. So that's a whole yeah. lot. <laughs> <laughs> you you made the, me do that, Hans. You made me do that. The book yeah, or the, the TV, TV adaptation? Which one? Yeah, the TV. Of the, yeah, I know. Yeah, I heard that. So I was just listening to you guys today saying how much it sucked. Yeah, it was yeah. terrible. It's Big probably time. the worst adaptation of, uh, I think it's even worse than some of the Children of the Corn movies. But, uh, but did it at least start good or was it bad from minute one? Um, it, it, it was I, I shaky think, from the start for me. But Yeah, I think maybe the first couple of episodes, uh, because it, it was very uh, it was very visually good. It yeah. looked good. Production value uh, for, mo- for most of the stuff. So, so uh, the first couple of episodes, I think it was okay. Uh, and then it just dropped. Thanks to great colorists, of course. That's of why. course. Yeah, <laughs> That's of course, why. of course. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, so, Shout out to yeah. whoever did it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I definitely, we, we definitely don't, you know, give everything that he writes a pass. I mean, for me, you mentioned Tommy Knockers. I think that's probably one of his worst books um, myself. But uh, See, I, I kind of really like that one because it had to do with the. <laughs> See what it means? This guy doesn't agree with anybody. No, well, yeah. here's the thing. It wasn't it's you. It wasn't. No, it's you. It wasn't up to the level of, say, Pet Cemetery. But I didn't see the hate for Tommy Knockers. And the unabashed love of the stand. I, okay, so I'm completely flip flopped on those this two is how books. It works, man. Mm-hmm. See, I get you know? to get the entire audience on my side. I love the stand, and I've heard that Tommy Knockers isn't so good. He likes Tommy Knockers and doesn't like the stand. Come Who on, are you make, gonna believe? They make huh? perpetual motion huh? out of like you AA batteries in an egg crate. That's a, that's an awesome concept, and she's got a, a typewriter that types all of her all of her books like perfectly. That's that's like writer's fantasy right there. <laughs> so you're. Wasn't, really... I think there was a flying coke machine I'm in that too, it, wasn't there? Yeah. I'm not buying yeah. it. <laughs> It's been it's you been guys a number make of up years. your own mind. All right, I think I've made yeah. my case. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I will say it, uh, Hans. I, I don't know if you, if you'll agree with the statement that uh, out of the the books, last ten or so books he's done, I, I think eleven twenty two sixty three really, in many ways, was a return to his uh, form of his earlier works because I just think he. I think maybe it's because he had to keep the spine of his narrative was restricted to historical facts, which kind of kept him more focused. But I think that's why, for me, the 112263 really sings as a narrative. Yeah, I agree. Well, in the later it, books, um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're good. I've only read, um, well, I've read, I'm looking at the list here and I'm like, I haven't read very much. No, I, I guess I have. <laughs> uh, I did read Black House from a Buick 8. One, two, three, four Dark Tower books. I started The Cell, but didn't care for it. Started Blaze, didn't care for it. 1122-63, I, I think, is wonderful. I got halfway through Doctor Sleep, and I really like it. I'd like to uh, keep that, reading it. That's one I want to get to, too, because I love The Shining so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, that's pretty much where I'm at. Uh, I really enjoyed the Dark Tower stuff with a lot of caveats. I had a plenty of problems with a lot of it, but I really enjoyed it. So uh, I it's, guess I'm... It's so I'm ambitious. Down. you got to tip your hat off to him for yeah, cro- crossing yeah. so many genres so you're saying anything from what was it 1999 on yeah let me take a look at what we got here oh girl who loved tom gordon yeah i didn't care for that that was uh, i didn't hate it but i just it didn't uh, didn't click with me wizard in class no no i think you should no, definitely try no, out no. mr mercedes and and the two following books uh, i've seen the covers a, um yeah. I'm, unfortunately yeah. right now uh you know chris uh 
well, between this podcast and Chris, uh, you know, convincing me, you know, to read it again, I, I'm I'm out of commission for a pretty long time. So. <laughs> well, they're <laughs> they're making a TV series of the Mr. Mercedes trilogy, so you guys might be busy with that later on. <laughs> Yeah, it could be, but we don't want to don't be give Albie any ideas. Yeah, don't. exactly. <laughs> All right, right I'll, I'll edit that out. Yeah, we're cornering, we're cornering the really niche market, like a niche you didn't even know existed of time travel, Kennedy assassination, thriller. Okay. And <laughs> apparently, there's a lot more there to talk about. Oh, we're than, your guys. Than we, we uh, we're your guys, right. man. Right. Wow. Yeah, I can tell you that um, aside from the Dark Tower stuff, I have not read anything but eleven twenty two sixty three. Okay. In the last in the last sixteen years or so, it's right. funny. Uh, I'll just make one plug for one book that I don't know if you guys have read it or not. Is uh, Bag of Bones, especially the, <sighs> that was good, especially I, the I, audio I, versions because Stephen King does a narration and that just, yes, that is just fantastic. Okay, thank you. No. All right, <laughs> no, damn it. No, he. I reads love you. when he reads his book. Not only yeah. audio books. Ha, Chris. In your <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Audiobooks rock, and when King reads it, it's even better. Everybody yeah. needs yeah. to know that when Skipper says he's reading something, reading is an air quote. He's see, actually see. listening to it. There Here we go. go. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, Chris, you sort of gave us your thoughts on 112263. Is there anything else that you wanted to add about your thoughts on the book? Oh, um, I just think that as far as King's work, I love the fact that he was able to do a time travel story that me, as a time travel writer, didn't have any problems with at all because that was, uh, I said, trepidation from falling out of love with his work um, over the last 20 years or so and then coming back to it somewhat reluctantly, not really reluctantly, but just like convince me. You're going to have to convince me. And then when I heard this was a time travel book, I said, well, he's a horror writer. What is he going to teach me about time travel? It's just going to annoy me that he's, that he's playing in this world. <laughs> And actually, I thought he did a wonderful job with that aspect of the book, too. So not only did it stand up as being a King book that I loved in the sense that it reminded me of old King books that I love, mm -hmm. but it worked as a time travel novel as well. And to convince me that a time travel book is good takes some doing. OK. How about you, Skipper? 112263, generally speaking, is a book. It, it already was something I would have picked up anyways, even if he hadn't written it, even though I didn't know about all these other books, but I'm catching up. Ha ha. But <laughs> the concept of, <clears throat> well, I hate to say it, but I have become a bit of a uh, John F. Kennedy assassination buff, so to speak, not a conspiracy buff because I'm not a conspiracy buff, but um, I got started with uh, Oliver Stone's movie and uh, have devoured you know plenty of other books and documentaries and such since right. then so to hear him go after that i was already on board then on but now i can say having now either read or looked at other versions of this similar story no one's coming close he he's hitting not only is he just doing some of his best work you know that i've you know yeah, I love Bag of Bones. I love Green Mile. It, to me, it's all in. Uh, it rises up there above some of the uh, some of mm, some of the lesser books. Definitely, I think this is in his upper echelon. I love eleven twenty two sixty three. Okay. Yeah. I, he he did two really clever things with this. One in reference to what Chris was talking about with the time travel, is he he locked it down so that there's you know there's no you knew that whatever happened is is going to stick. Um, because if when you come back then every and go back again, then everything's going to be lost. So that was really good to lock it down. And the other thing that he did is he didn't jump right into the the, the whole Kennedy thing. He yeah. set up this Jake Epping character with this other storyline, so mm -hmm. that by the time he does move on to the to the main plot, we're really invested in this character and hoping that he succeeds uh, in his mission. I guess you could say. So I I really like the story quite a bit as well. Well, if you listen to our podcast, you'll realize that I like the story of Jake so much and yeah. the Sadie and the, the Jody part that once he did focus back on Oswald, I was annoyed. I was like, you know, oh. screw that mission. Just <laughs> That's Jake. Right. I, I don't, who cares about Oswald at this point? So. Right. Okay. Um, did, uh, I, have to, I have to ask you, uh, did you pick up on the, the different stuff that goes uh, into the King universe that was in the book, like when he meets the two characters from it and uh, Derry and stuff like that. Did you did you catch any of that, or was did that was that lost on you, Chris? Okay, well, you need to listen to episode zero point two 
of our podcast called uh, what we'd call it, The Janitor's Father. That's the one that's currently out now. Yeah. Uh, I basically gave a soliloquy of why I love it and vomited my heart out <laughs> about every connection that was in that dairy section and how it brought back so many memories from formative years of my of my reading youth, so to speak. And that that section of the book, to me, is the strongest section of the novel. That could be a novel in itself, and I'm happy. So, yeah, I not only did I get it, but it made me love the book, like, unabashedly. And that shamed me into needing to read it again because I didn't remember. <laughs> I remember the basics, and I certainly uh, remember the flavor, but I didn't remember specifics, uh, you know, with character names and so on and so forth. So it made me want to pick it back up. But then the only other connection that I remember was the Plymouth Fury, the Red Plymouth Fury, which I automatically assume is the same year as Christine. Other than that, I didn't catch any other uh, any other crossovers. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I s assume you guys have been following the uh, promo materials and so forth that have been coming out. And I'm wondering what's your thoughts on what the series is shaping up to look like is for you. Chris, you want to go for that? Uh, sure. I have been looking at that trailer over and over again and over and over. <laughs> um, I think that they're poised to do a good adaptation there are things that i like about it i think james franco actually works as jake more than people are going to give him credit for because i know mm -hmm. that people said they thought he was really miscast and i think he's he's got good range so he should be able to pull it off i love chris cooper as oh Al yeah Templeton. you know he's terrific brilliant brilliant and, casting and i think that they're going to capture the look and the spirit of the book as far as like a period piece. I like that. But then there are things about it that give me some pause uh, in the sense that the, the past, this is something we've discussed on our podcast quite a bit, or anyway, I've tried to force on Skipper. That <laughs> Thanks the, a lot. <laughs> the whole, the whole idea in the book about the obdurate past my contention is that if you're going to set that up as a conceit, then you are de facto giving the past some kind of agency to work against Jake. And if there is some agency at work, then who's in control of that agency? Is it some kind of nefarious force? Who's, who's that guiding hand that is putting those things in his way? And there's a scene in the first trailer, the first full-length trailer that came out, with a woman lying in the street, like, bleeding. Mm -hmm. And she looks up at Jake and she says, you shouldn't be here. So are they going to play on that in a more overt way in the series? That looks interesting to me. And I want to save a lot of this discussion because our podcast leading up to the uh, miniseries, we're going to be doing five book podcasts and then sort of a wrap up saying mm -hmm. what we expect. But I was just discussing this with Skip the other night. You see in that trailer, um, there were some of the, pro and it's not in that trailer, it's some of the other promo material. You, they'll have a shot of James Franco in the car and they're pulling back, and as they pull back, you see a bunch of pink threads that all lead sort of to him, almost like a like a web. And if you recall what the um, yellow card man says at the end of the book about the strings, and they, they got to keep track of these threads, it wouldn't surprise me seeing that uh, Al Templeton's character is in all nine episodes. Um, many of the characters that are just in certain sections of the book are somehow in all nine episodes. I think they're going to do it nonlinear. I think we're going to see different aspects of the story unfolding concurrently, and it'll all come together in the mm -hmm. end somehow. That's just that's complete supposition on my part, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that. The other things that give me some pause seems to be a much bigger CIA presence in this, and mm -hmm. they really seem, especially with the episode rundown that's actually on your site, uh, Hans, yeah. the 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 descriptions make it seem like it's they're leaning towards the conspiracy angle of things where the book completely does away with that. So I, it'd be inter it really interesting to me to see if they do a 180 and go completely in the opposite direction of the book. See, these are, yeah, you're right. We haven't really spoken about this yet. Uh, when it comes to the promo materials, um, I have a certain, well, that's going to sound dirty, and I don't want to get dirty. But I, uh, I, I have a honed talent. That's a better way to say it. Mm -hmm. I have a honed talent. A gift. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, this to practice. <laughs> okay. I won't call it a gift. Okay. Um, I have a, a bit of 
purposeful stupidity. Yeah, 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 that'll work. Um, <laughs> just I, I deliberately. Oh boy, I want to. Uh, I I. Oh, just say it. I know, I know. Spit I it out, man. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> I deliberately don't want to absorb too much. Okay. So I don't want to you know, really take apart the frame and try and figure every little thing out because I really love to be surprised later. So over the years, uh, when you work on something, unfortunately, everything's being spoiled for you. But all you got to do is ignore it. And hey, you might actually enjoy what you work on. That's a terrible thing to say. But, you know, sometimes you're working on something you really care about and you don't want to have it completely burned into your head. So I have built a muscle, so to speak. I have oh, yeah. built up a tolerance to just, I, I can just just let it hit my eyeballs and just kind of enjoy it, but try not to take it in. I don't want to dissect it because I, I want the story itself to unfold naturally the way the filmmakers intended. So I have not taken apart the trailer, mm. even though I've seen it at least 30 times. <laughs> I did not catch the threads and I, I just, I love the mood of it. I love the style of it. And I loved how it seemed to honor the book, but all these little things seem to be there just for me. Hey, you, you read the book. Check this out. Oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and so I kept being surprised at all these little things. And you know what? I want that to happen in the show. So when I saw uh, I was given the link uh, to your website, hey, here's a rundown of all the episodes. Screw you, man. I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't even want to know the titles. Yeah, and I, I agree with you on that, Skip. I'm, I'm usually so spoiler phobic that I'll stay off social media days before I see a movie or something because I just don't want to know. I, I like to go into books cold. I like to go into movies cold. And it was almost like having to break a cardinal rule of mine to read some of the rundowns and to really get more of a flavor of what the series is going to be like as an adaptation because I already know how the book ends. And no matter what they do in the series, they can't take that away. You know, the book will always be the book. It'll always be there. So the series could be something great or it could be something horrible. But You're it's so wrong. But You're it's so not. Wrong. It's not gonna. <laughs> how could it be wrong? He's covering the wrong. pupil. <laughs> the end of that is nothing like the book. You don't know the ending. You can't guess the ending. You know, because JFK lives. I'll say it. I spoiled it for you. JFK lives, and that's how this that's, thing. But ends. that's beside the point. What I'm saying is that <laughs> you don't know. This is not this a glorious is why, bastard. This Come is on. this is why they think that we don't agree. It's just that Skip is arbitrary to be arbitrary. That's no, that's I'm just not. The way he was taught to converse. I think I don't uh, know. No, apparently, I don't know. See, <laughs> no, the stand is great. You don't like it. Tell me, I'm I'm really going off on a you know way. No, that's crazy talk, Skip. Yeah. Crazy talk. That is crazy talk. Who, who would like that long, rambling, <laughs> self-indulgent novel? It's it's just too much. Hands yeah. up, right here. Hands yeah. up, <laughs> hands in the air, right yeah. here. <laughs> but but uh, what is your general feeling when you see the trailers and stuff? Do you think they will succeed in doing a, a good uh, adaptation, or are you are you fear fear of it that it will be a, a bad one? I have no fear at all. Honestly, it looks incredible. I, I, that's why I keep watching the trailer. And I love that song in the trailer, and I'm just completely sucked in. I am honestly really excited about next month. So uh, I'm, I'm all on board. I, and I will be honestly let down if it sucks. <laughs> it's going to bother me because I'm not, I'm not phantom menacing it and putting it up on a pedestal, but I guess I am because it better be good. <laughs> and, wow. and if it's not, we're going we're gonna to tear them apart. <laughs> You know, I, I think that from looking at the trailer and from just reading some of the episode descriptions, my one and only trepidation is that they are going to fundamentally change Jake and his character trajectory, uh, make it much different and probably a little bit darker than we see in the book. And I think that maybe just be demands of the current entertainment climate. People like antiheroes, people like dark stories and you know, if if yeah. that's the flavor of the day, you have a story that can naturally lend itself to that. So they might tweak it in that way and make Jake's choices a little bit more bleak, a little bit more stark and a little bit more unsettling. Even though you have all of that in the course of 112263, you never lose the, the thread of Jake as a good guy who is just trying to do the right thing. Right. This is making him look like. He might get increasingly desperate as the story goes on. So I'm interested to see how they portray him and if ultimately it will be good for that series or bad for that series. Right. You know, you brought up something great when you talk about the CIA connection and how they might 
go forward into pushing the conspiracy angle more because I thought that was possibly one of the weaker parts of the book with the bugging of the lamp and bugging Oswald. And I didn't think any of that really paid off all that well um, because you're right. They really just kind of went, well, Oswald did it and that's the story. And they don't, it, it isn't that much of a suspense, but in the movie or excuse me, in the miniseries, it, you're right. They could, introduce that concept that really could be something that they try to you know keep the uh, keep the audience guessing so that's an interesting point of view and i'm not going to respond because we need to save that gold for our our uh, oh. podcast so <laughs> you think, think we can't I, keep talking we're just no, getting just, warmed up let's put it this way i want eat things <laughs> i want <laughs> i want people to hear it for the first time with us because uh, boy i have so much to say to that you have no idea uh, well and we look forward to hearing it um yeah, yeah I, I I just say like I I really love the trailers as well because it look they look so cinematic and it's just amazing how the gap between TV and, and movies seems to be getting closer and closer. Um, I I just can't, it, it looks like a movie when you watch it and it, you know uh, I I have a soft spot for character actors and when you get somebody like Chris Cooper to because he's got to sell the time travel aspect of the movie and it, these kind of character actors really ground the movies like can you get Ian McKellen to play Gandalf mm. these are the ends for the audience that they you know they take what seems ridiculous and they make it seem plausible and I just you know just hear Chris Cooper talk in that trailer uh just gives me goosebumps so I'm really looking forward to his uh portrayal and uh I I have some qualms too the CIA stuff gave me pause and that woman mm. that woman saying you don't belong here I was kind of going that's a little on the nose but you know, you're playing for a broader audience. So unfortunately, I think sometimes uh, they try to make things a little too clear. But we'll have to see how that plays out. And Hans, I don't know if yeah. you want to say anything, but <laughs> sure, sure. Well, uh, I won't comment on the on on the uh, trailer because uh, I have actually seen all eight episodes already. Yeah, how did you um, manage that? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> twenty years of fan site. <laughs> Yeah, your site is terrific, by the way. It's yeah, just, it looks really great. wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I, I've actually seen uh, all eight episodes. I think I, I watch one a day for a week. Um, so like I, I don't, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I can't say much about them because I, I can't do that now. Are oh, you embargoed? Yeah, exactly. So uh, I won't comment on the trailers either because I might say too much. So I let oh, no. you talk about it, and I just uh, you just nod appreciate about your <laughs> wonderings and knowing <laughs> and laugh how at us right all they think that. Oh. <laughs> so naive. So well, naive. Here's yeah. the thing: you know, you would be doing a service to poor Albie and poor Juan, who have to edit our shows on the fly, especially <laughs> yes. in in the wake when the series comes out. We're we're going to be watching the episodes then getting on the mic, recording the episodes, and they're going to be pulling all-night sessions to edit them and get them out as soon as possible, hopefully the next day. So if somehow somebody could find a way for us to get some kind of advanced screening of this series, it no, would take no, a no, lot no, of pressure no, off no, of our me, production man. team. LB. <laughs> I'm surprised he hasn't got that done for you yet. Guys, well, that's up. because he needs to hook up with, with, with Hans. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's how. There you go. <laughs> and not not for Hans to give him his copies. For Hans to put him in touch with someone that give us our copies. That's all. Yeah, I, I you know, I the, the idea of uh, reviewing each episode uh, as it airs is very attractive. But I, I, in some ways, I like what we have going is that because we only podcast twice a month, so we have time to uh, you know watch the episodes more than once and digest them and uh, solidify our thoughts before. Because sometimes you know your first impressions change quite often if, when you watch it the second time. So. I, th yeah. I think you're right, but I think that'll be a, a fun part of the ride. And yep. I have a feeling that um, after all the episodes have aired, and since we are going to basically be talking about them in a knee-jerk way, mm -hmm. Skip, I'm thinking <laughs> of another bonus episode. Oh, uh, no. As, as no, just bad like, idea. Just like we're going to be doing the book wrap-up and looking forward to the series, we should probably, after the series is completely done, do a wrap-up episode Upon reflection, saying, okay, well, we didn't like it in the moment, but how did it all come together? And tell you what, tell yeah. you what, how about... Yeah. So you're, are you inviting us to your podcast then? No, I, <laughs> yes, first off. Oh, was, no, wait a minute, you ruined it. You ruined it. Okay, okay, edit this out. Cut out the last 30 seconds. Ready? And action.
<laughs> guys, there's a great idea here. Let's save a few hairs on Juan Miro's head and make him not edit the show. And let's come on your show and give a final wrap up. We could do that, but you ruined it. Apparently, you guys want to come on ours, which we can do. Uh, I'm, I'm game. Awesome. Another episode. Great sure. idea. Mm-hmm. We're not the great producers, idea. but I think we have Paul with the producers. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Pull. this is Pull. the part of the right. podcast where you guys go f- in full, uh, full out pimp mode. Tell us about your podcast. What are your plans? Um, your details. You've sort of um, referenced them uh, off and on during the podcast, but if you can lay it out a little more. Ooh, ooh, Chris, can I go? Of course, please. Um, I want to give one quick plug. Um, sure. Lou, I think you blew it, man. You, you, I All handed right. it to you, and you blew it. You <laughs> talked about the great look of the show, and you didn't thank the colorist. I don't know well, where I, you were. That's you under know? that umbrella. That's under that umbrella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Implied, sure. Okay, but I'm I don't here want to, to leave help. out the sound guys. I'm here to help. I'm here Everybody, to help. You know, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> we, uh, I want to throw a little love to David Katz Nelson. Who, who that guy? He's the guy who shot the uh, the pilot. And uh, he was the director of photography. He set the look. And why do I bring up David Katz Nelson? Because he probably loves to hear his name. Hey, David. Hi. <laughs> I'm bringing him up because I know him. Ooh. Nice. No, no, no. I don't know him at all. But I did get him on the phone oh. and we got a great interview with him. Awesome. But that ain't the only one. We got an interview with him and I got an interview with Dorian Harris and uh, actor Kevin Dennis, who was in it. And then Chris got a bunch of cool interviews, too. Who'd you talk to? I spoke to an actress, Tanya Pinkins, who plays Ms. Mimi. I spoke to uh, Miranda Calderon, who plays Ruth. I don't remember her last Ruth name. Payne. Ru- Ruth Payne. Yes, thank you very much. And the other interviews I've done are for our like addenda episodes. But why don't we answer your question first in the sense of how the podcast is going to unfold? We've already done the first two episodes. We're going to be devoting the first five episodes to the book. And we're breaking the book down in pretty pretty basic terms, uh, how the book flows. So okay. episode one is uh, called a Watershed Moment. Point one, Ep- point one. Episode, yeah, I'm sorry, 0.1 is a Watershed Moment. 0.2, Janitor's Father. We just recorded point three, Living in the Past, last night. Uh, point four is going to be Oswald in 11.22.63. And point five is going to be The Aftermath. And I don't know what we're going to call that one yet, but we're just that, that's that's the pin we've put in at the aftermath and how things have changed and what happens. Yeah, that's at the a end. good episode to bring them on. So yeah, we can, talk, we can talk about the book in depth and and, and our yeah. thoughts about the series or no, no, no. We were going to talk about. Sorry. Right. right. Bring and them then in for the Hulu series. Sorry. Yeah, because I think then what happens is when we're done with those five episodes, it, there's going to be a two week hiatus. So the week before the series starts. We're going to be doing our thoughts about what we think the adaptation is going to look like and what we hope for. Okay. And then the marathon begins. We do one a week for each series. And then after that, we'll probably do a wrap up show like we just discussed. Mm-hmm. And then after the wrap up show, we have these bonus episodes that we're putting in the can, which deal with other JFK time travel thriller properties. So, for example, one of those things that we're going to be talking about is a movie called Time Quest, which had Bruce Campbell in it. I've already spoken to the director, Robert Dyke. He was an awesome guy. And I spoke to the woman who played Jacqueline Kennedy in that movie. Her name is Caprice Benedetti. And she was terrific to talk to as well. And those are the different kinds of interviews that we've done. And once this thing builds more of a, we hope, a critical mass and some momentum, we want to speak to anybody from the series and everybody because it's just so interesting to hear the stories of how these things came together. And our producer, Juan, is he's phenomenal at getting these interviews. He'll just call me and he'll say, uh, can you do an interview on Tuesday? And I'm like, yes, um, okay. <laughs> and who's it with? And okay, I guess I can prep now. Oh, how many movies do I have to watch? And what book do I have to read? But it's it's been terrific. I wouldn't put it past him to get like Bruce Campbell because Bruce Campbell was in Time Quest right. or James Franco because he's just, he can wheedle his way in. So who awesome. knows? We might, we might be able to speak to James Franco. We might be able to speak to Chris Cooper. We might be able to speak to J.J. Abrams or Stephen King. So Awesome. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope that works out for you guys. Yeah. Do yeah, you think that's a blast. decent idea? Bring you guys in at the wrap up show for the Hulu miniseries. We can bring, uh, talk to you guys there, and we can talk about now that it's over, and and bring you guys onto that episode. That sound cool. Uh, I would be sure. honored. That'd be Great. a blast. Yeah. 
because you know we don't talk enough. We that's, need more yeah. voices. Yeah, yeah that's right. You guys, you guys probably thought this was going to be a short interview, but we've already spoken for an hour, and we just yeah. got to how the podcast is going to break down. So yes. you realize what you've gotten yourself into. <laughs> well, I was looking at your Clearly. podcasts that you've already done. They're only like three hours. I mean, really, <laughs> only a bunch of pikers. <laughs> <laughs> We have very, very many things to say on very, very many topics, and uh, so all of it's so gold. Yeah. All That's of it's, all gold. Uh, all who needs one? No <laughs> editor needed, man. Leave it so all in. That's right. One clarification. The uh, interviews you've done with the actors that are involved with the 112263, are they going to be sprinkled throughout your episode reviews, or are you doing them as a separate episode? No, you have it precisely right. Um, we will save those interviews for the episodes on which those characters premiere. Oh, cool. So we'll be talking about, so say when Ms. Mimi finally comes into the picture, when we talk about that episode, then the Tanya Pinkins interview will air during that episode. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Hans? Yeah, uh, and I, I think that uh, usually it's uh, very interesting to think, to talk to the people behind the camera that you don't see. Like colorists. See how they... No. Yeah, like the colorists. Oh. <laughs> now you're sucking up. <laughs> yeah. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. To, to hear the story of how things uh, came about and how they did certain things and stuff like that. I think often that is more more interesting than actually talking to the actors. Uh, oh, here, here. And here, I'll, here. Yeah, I'll agree with you 100% <laughs> on that. In the sense that the actors are always great, but they only know that one part of it that they've prepared yeah. for. And what they bring to it is pretty awesome to hear and how they approach it because it all works together. But speaking to, say, Robert Dyke, who wrote that Time Quest movie, I was able to ask him not only about the inspiration for the story, but the movie is put together in a nonlinear way that's very unique, and I really enjoyed it. So I got to speak to him about that process and the way they edited it and how they had to shoot it. And it was really, you know, a much more comprehensive feel of, of the project, as opposed to speaking to the woman who played Jackie Caprice. Uh, Caprice was awesome. She she was just game to talk about anything, but you know she knew that one aspect of it, and it yeah. brings good yeah. depth to that one aspect. But it's yeah. it's it's kind of a different ball game when you're able to speak to, say Robert Dyke, who wrote and directed it, or like Skip has spoken to one of the editors, I think on yeah, on Dorian the project. Harris. Yeah, so Dorian has a much better insight as to what went into putting the series together overall. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. an unusual point of view or uh, an unusual comment to make, but honestly, the interviews for me have been the most fun because they don't disagree with me on every damn thing I say. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to keep you in line, fan boy. Yeah. 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 But I really have loved the interviews and also uh, really listening to Chris's interviews too because there are the basic um, on the surface questions, but all of these conversations we've had with these people seem to be going in unique directions that I didn't expect. So uh, for me, uh, I hate to say it, you know, as much as I may love my own voice, I'm looking more forward to the interviews because I, I, they're turning out so good. That's just my opinion. That's fantastic. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I agree. and if you, if, if you can find someone to interview that really likes to talk, you can. You often drift into things that you didn't plan on asking. and well, uh, that, You don't have to worry about that, man. You're going to experience it firsthand. <laughs> you come on the show because we've been nice. Okay, I think, we're I think, guests on your yeah. show. You I know, think somebody just took a swipe at us. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. We, we, you know, we, we've been good. We've been on good behavior. Albert Albert said don't insult. You know, we, we, we appreciate it. We left it. our shoes at the door. <laughs> yeah. But when you come on our show, when you're on our turf, right. we got questions for you guys. Awesome. Yeah. There you go. We got, right. we got questions. Because that's what we do. Okay. <laughs> so any particulars about uh, the podcast location on the internet that you want to give out? Details of that, that Chris, nature? You're, you're such a pro at this. I'll, I'll give the basic and then you give the rest. How's that? All right. Let me. Uh, the website is barrenspace.com slash 112263. That's barrenspace.com 112263. And give me a moment. You're going to have to edit this out. I have to open my recent documents and get all of uh, Here, wait, 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 wait. Take a, Take a look I at your Skype. I got it. I got it. Oh, you got it. it. Yeah, I got it. I'm. I got my computer right here, buddy. I'm not like you. I'm prepared <laughs> for this crap. Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going so, home. What'd Wait, you give, I am what'd home. You, okay, he gave the website. Everybody knows that. Baronspace.com slash eleven twenty two sixty three. But where the real action at is emailing us and sending us MP3. That's a dig, man. That's a dig. <laughs> <laughs> so you can always email us at eleven twenty two sixty three podcast at gmail dot com. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash 112263podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at 112263podcast. 
You can follow us on Instagram at Instagram.com slash 112263podcast. Or you can even call us and tell us what you think about our show at 707-847-6682. That's 707-847-6682. But if you go to our website, barrenspace.com slash 112263, you'll find all this information as well as the latest episodes and ways you can subscribe either on iTunes or Stitcher. There'll be links to do either of those things. So yeah. See, Hans, that's how you get it done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he does it every how week because he can do it, man. I can't go. Yeah. Okay. Because apparently I don't have a computer. <laughs> apparently. My abacus and Did writing you... in dirt over here. <laughs> Did you turn it on and off? I don't do nothing, man. How, how much interaction are you hoping for, for your, from your listeners? Oh, as much as possible because we never shut the hell up. So we'd like to have somebody else get a voice in this thing too. No, wait a minute. We, we actually read a book, you know, because one of the you know our list, uh, a listener had asked us to. So you know, we're, we're paying attention. We do care. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And okay. That, uh, yeah. That Any... feedback is vital to us. So yeah. please, everybody, please give us some feedback. Yeah, feedback. Yeah. We li- podcasters live for feedback. So come on. All right. Uh, anything else about eleven twenty two sixty three that you want to mention? Or, well, the only thing that's important, you know, the mm-hmm. great podcast that you guys do to talk oh. about things like 112263. <laughs> there you go. And this uh, part was seriously. not paid for, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Spontaneous. All right. I like it. All right. Uh, and but Lou and Hans, you guys have been great. And thank you very much for uh, allowing us to come on and oh, spill it's, our words. It's our honor. It's, it's been a blast. And before yeah. we let you go, we have a bonus round question for you. Uh, there's been a lot of kerfuffle. Is that a word that I should use? Yeah, uh, yeah. My, my boss in the King 70s. fandom, in regards to a potential bit of casting news for the Dark Tower, and the casting news is for Idris Elba. Are you both aware of the actor? Yes. yes. To play Roland. Thoughts on that? Hans doesn't like it. I think it's fantastic. I'm curious to see, hear what you guys think. Um, you go first. I, yeah. Yeah, I could start on that one. Uh, When it comes to Idris Elba, I feel bad for the guy because he seems to be developing a trend. He got kicked around for possibly being James Bond, and then he got, you know, more controversy for being Heimdall in the Thor movies, and now he's getting crapped on for being Roland, and then I heard he's up for the, you know, he's going to play Whitey Bulger in the sequel to Black Mass, ha, ha, ha. But, you know, (laughs) the guy, you know, he's going to get nailed no matter what he does. He can't do any white roles without just keep... You know, playing out this trope of you're black and why are you playing a white character? I think sooner or later people are going to get tired of that. No, they're not. They're just not. They're going to mention it every time. Although, although, if I have to be honest, um, the only thing that bothers me, and I think I'm completely cribbing here, so I'm probably completely ripping you off, Chris, but somebody had said, someone smarter than me, that the character interaction between Susanna Odetta and the whitey that she called him throughout the book. Um, yeah, that's going to suffer unless you make a really beautiful, wonderful black character, Susanna Odetta, into a white girl. You're now going to cause, you know, you're, you're going to change the book. But then again, it's adapted. And that's the whole point of adapting. So I don't know what they're going to do. But it seems to suffer. Personally, for me, I always wanted Scott Glenn. I always thought he was the perfect Roland, but now he's way too old. But for mm-hmm. me, that guy was perfect Roland. Idris Elba, wonderful actor. Bet he'll do a great job. Hope it doesn't hurt the movie. Hmm. Well, we all know how I feel about the Dark Tower. Well, maybe we don't, but uh, Skip and I have gotten to it on our podcast. I can just say this. As far as a Dark Tower adaptation goes, the fact that they are casting Idris Elba as Roland Duchesne makes me interested in the project. Now I'm excited to see where they go with it because I think Idris Elba is amazing. If you don't know his work, Mm -hmm. just watch a little show called The Wire. The first three seasons, he plays Stringer Bell, and he is the whole show. He is so good. I can't imagine why anybody would have a problem with him being Roland, except for the color of his skin. And I understand that, but you hear so many people in the fan community just have these knee-jerk reactions to not just the fact that he's black, but that it's different. Oh, it's it's just not what we're used to. It's not it's not how it was portrayed. So 
you have things like this where Idris Elba is going to play Roland or you have uh, black Jimmy Olsen, say, on the Supergirl series now and people saying, oh, but Jimmy Olsen's not black. But but who cares? He, he captures the character. Mm-hmm. And but it, it's the same with anything. People were upset when there was going to be a female Starbuck on Battlestar. And look how that turned out. Yep. People were upset. Fans were upset that. Daniel Craig was going to play James Bond because he's got <laughs> blonde hair. How can there be a blonde haired James yeah. Bond? That's he's the best Bond ever. So Roland's got to have blue eyes, or it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. I, I just I, I think when when they talk hmm. about this stuff, it is not necessarily have. It doesn't necessarily have to do with race, although for many people that's a big part of it. I think that fans and fanboys are just enamored of what they're used to, mm-hmm. and they resist any kind of change, which is why you have comic book universes that seem to rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall again, because whenever a publisher tries to do something different, everybody says this sucks, we're not going to buy the book anymore, so then they have to retcon it back to the way it was in you know 1930 or whatever. Right. And I think that that fan obstinacy is the real issue here. I think once people see Idris Elba as Roland, all questions are going to go out the window. I think they're going to say it's terrific in as much as the adaptation is terrific. I don't see where having him on the project is going to be anything but a plus. Yeah. But you got to admit to have him in the role, if you put any white guy in the role, he's automatically going to be compared to Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Well, that's, gotta, that's how I saw a role in the entire yeah. series. So. Yeah, well, that's how King saw him too, right? So Exactly. So yeah. the minute you put Idris Elba in the role, you instantly make it you know, something more unique, something different, mm-hmm. something that strays. So uh, I'm not against it at all, personally. Yeah. I like To be El- Elba is such a good actor that uh, um, when I saw him on The Wire, I was stunned later on to find out that he was actually British. I had, yeah, no, so I, I had no idea. <laughs> and you know, McNulty is Australian, I think. So, I mean, everybody yeah. on that production was uh, was playing something way out of what they really were. And it was a terrific production. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, if, so, he was able to, if he was able to carry that, I'm sure he can carry the Dark Tower. Yeah. So, like, me and Hans have had have already done a podcast on us. We talked about this for almost an hour, I think, ourselves. So, I'm not really going to add anything. If people want to hear what well, we are thoughts. Both, man. Yeah. Jeez, you guys go on forever. Well, compared, <laughs> you compared, never you guys, compared to you guys, we're, we're just <laughs> beginners. But, uh, uh, so, uh, I don't know, Hans, is there anything you want to add? I, I have a question uh, for I you think... guys. Yeah. I, I really wanted to ask you guys this okay. because I knew I was talking to other Stephen King aficionados. Chris mm-hmm. doesn't count because he doesn't like to stand. Anyways, <laughs> I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> If you, because he went back to Doctor Sleep, and I've I want to ask fans this: when he decides twenty thirty whatever years to go back and do a sequel to The Shining, which is almost blasphemous, you can't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can, and he did it. <laughs> and he did a great job. Yeah. If he if he's going to do a sequel to any of his classic books, and Chris, you can answer this too. <laughs> it's the going to. What would you want to see a sequel to? Pick any of his classic stuff. What would you okay. want to see a sequel to? Hans. Uh, yeah, I think I would like to see a sequel to Firestarter. Oh, Chris, he's Hans, sucking you up stole you. my answer. <laughs> That's been yeah, done a couple you. of times already. But uh, <laughs> for myself, I would actually like to see a sequel to Salem's Lot. I'd love to see uh, the the, yeah. the adventures of Ben Mears and Mark Petrie after they left Salem's Lot and what they did. Um, did they just go vamp hunting for the rest of their lives, or like what did those guys do? Uh, they're on a little show called Supernatural on the CW. <laughs> yeah, it would be very similar, wouldn't it? Probably, but I, I still would like to see that. I think. Now, you guys tell me. I think Jensen Ackles would have made a pretty good Roland if they were going to go white. Um, no, huh? Oh, <laughs> it's too short. You see, you're reading a lot into that long pause, and you're right. <laughs> he's, too, he's too short. Basically, <laughs> he, he, he could probably do it, though. Yeah, yeah he's got that certain cragginess about him. Yeah. these days, so. I'm, uh, anyway. I'm really curious to see, uh, and I understand he just did a Western too. It's Clint Eastwood's son, uh, Scott Eastwood. Uh, I've, I don't know him. I've never seen him in anything, but you know, if, if he looks at anything like his dad and he can do a Western half decent, that could, would be an intriguing possibility too. But That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Chris, you got an answer? I said Firestarter. Um, I really love the way that that book ended because it was so open-ended. And uh, well, they were going to the offices of Rolling Stone. I'd love to see what happens to, I even forget the name of the character, but I really enjoyed that book. I enjoyed the relationship between her and Charlie. Her Charlie. Charlie, Charlie and um, 
oh jeez, uh, the boy from uh, Doctor Sleep. They should have got together. Danny, <laughs> Danny, oh, Danny yeah. Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if <laughs> if I had to say anything other than uh, Firestarter, it would have been The Shining. And Doctor Sleep is here, and I still haven't gotten around to reading it. But that's next on my list of King books. I think I said that already. Busy guys, ambitious guys. I like it. Yep, yep. <laughs> Pretty soon you're going to be starting your own Stephen King podcast. There you go. That's a no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's too uh, many no. good ones already, right? Yeah. Too many good ones like yours. They so, don't need so, so we hear. So we hear. I'd also like to mention the fact that I am an author. As I mentioned before, I published a Quantum Leap novel about a thousand years ago. But I have a new time travel novel. Available on my website at deflipside.com. That's D E F L I P S I D E.com. There you'll find my novella, The Seeker. It is a time travel novella about a time traveler who meets up with an invisible man and they team up to fight a genie. So I hope you guys go and check it out. While you're at my website, you can also find the latest episodes of my radio show, Deflipside. I think. The one that will be up by the time you guys get there is probably my best reads of 2015. So you can see how 112263 ranked among the other stuff that I read last year. Cool. So, Skip, what are you trying to sell? Uh, <laughs> in my neck of the woods, I uh, wrote and created a graphic novel called Bizarre New World, B-I-Z-A-R-R-E, BizarreNewWorld.com. And it tells the story of an average, ordinary schlub who one day in the real world you know, suddenly discovers he can actually fly. And later, it turns out he's really only the first, and the entire world takes off. So it literally becomes a full exploration of what would happen to the human race in a very lighthearted, back-to-the-future style tone, you know, what would happen mm -hmm. if the human race could fly. And that's BizarreNewWorld.com. Awesome. Any last words before we let you gents fly the coop? I would just like to thank you guys for having us on and to thank our producer, Albert Burge, for giving us this opportunity, not only to talk about The Dark Tower, uh, listen to me, The Dark Tower, 112263, but make, make it so inclusive that we can talk about The Dark Tower and can talk about all things Stephen King to the point where we're able to reach out to fellow people who enjoy it like you guys do. So right. hopefully we can just add to the dialogue. And if you listen to our show, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, thanks again to Albert Burge, and thanks to you guys. This was a lot of fun. Amen. I agree. Yeah. It was really nice to meet you, and this was a blast. Yep. All right. All right, guys. Thank you, so Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And Was uh, that what you expected? <laughs> yes. And it was, yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, pretty much from listening. From, <laughs> we don't from surprise here. nobody, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, after listening to us, if they had to, oh, we got to prep for this oh, interview. Oh, shit, guys. there's five hours of content. They've only been on for two oh. weeks. <laughs> so. Yeah, we, we clear this episode from everything else so just for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All we're going to do is our little bit of news, and then we're out of here. <laughs> yep. There you go. Okay, yeah, thanks, the next guys. Time you got a slow week. You just give us a call. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll yeah. talk, man. We're we're we love that freewheeling it. Don't forget that invite. Yeah, no, we will. We'll keep in the loop. Let's <laughs> bring you back. Okay. That's All right, awesome, awesome, guys. Really thanks like. a lot. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep, thanks, bye, -bye. bye bye. Bye. Okay, that's it for this podcast. I hope you enjoyed hearing Skipper and Chris as much as we did. They were a lot of fun to talk to, and I'm sure their podcasts are going to be great. I, for one, am going to listen to them. <laughs> In the next podcast, we are going to talk about The Stand. We're going to do the revisited, and we are going to watch the miniseries, the four episodes, again. So if you want to join in and maybe send in some comments on that, you should do that within the next couple of weeks. And also, before we go, I have a request. A fellow emailed me about the Misery show that was put up on Broadway. We reviewed it, or we didn't review it really, but we told, told you what other had told us. And this fellow had seen the, the theaters for himself, and he actually liked it and said it, it wasn't actually as bad as we had heard it was. wanted me to mention that, but... As sloppy as I am, I have lost your, your message. I think it was on Facebook or maybe an email, but I've lost it. And I actually don't remember your name either, so I'm very sorry for this. But if you can <laughs> get in touch with me again, and we will mention it in the next podcast. So do that. And, well, that it is, is it for us today. And hope to hear you in the next podcast. But until then, stay safe. 
But stay scared. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>